employer or manager, you know that you have certain training obligations required by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA. In this course, I'm going to guide you through the current OSHA hazard communication training requirements, so you can be sure your workplace is compliant. The OSHA hazard communication standard, or HCS, has undergone some revisions in the last few years. OSHA phased in these revisions between 2013 and 2016. If you are unsure about how the revisions impact your work, I recommend checking out the other hazard communication courses in this series. And before we dig into the training aspects of the revised standard, I want to mention that this course provides insight into federal compliance obligations. However, if you're responsible for ensuring your company's compliance, I highly recommend reading the full OSHA hazard communication standard reaching out to OSHA representatives, and making sure you are aware and implementing any state or local laws. Now, let's talk about hazard communication training. To begin with, you must fully inform your employees regarding the general requirements of the hazard communication standard, where they might be exposed to hazardous chemicals in the workplace, and how they can access the workplace hazard communication program. This is just basic information, but it should be covered for every new hire, and I recommend sending biannual reminders to veterans. Be sure to document the times you've shared this information, just in case you ever need to prove that you've informed your team. When it comes to training, the revised standard requires that employers provide training on all hazardous chemicals used in their work area. This training should be hands-on, and must take place any time an employee begins work with a new chemical. Don't just hand the employee the FDS and walk away. You need to have a conversation regarding the chemical use, storage procedures, safety precautions, and any other relevant information. Second, training should teach employees how to detect hazardous chemical exposure risks. For example, this could include how to read a device that monitors airborne chemical levels, or where they can access the documented levels. Or it might be as simple as what a hazardous chemical looks or smells like when released. Third, your training must cover all the risks associated with the chemicals in your workplace. It might be tempting to downplay the risks, but don't do it. Even if the risks are slight, informing your employees empowers them to treat every chemical in your workplace with care. Next, your training needs to include how employees can protect themselves from unsafe exposure. This includes learning proper work processes, including emergency procedures and any required personal protective equipment. For example, if safety goggles and special gloves are required, where does the employee find the PPE and what should they do with it after using it? This part of your training should also clearly identify who is responsible for the safety and personal protective equipment programs in your building. Your employees should always know who they can go to with questions. It's important to note that OSHA doesn't expect workers to memorize specifics about each chemical. Instead, your employees should learn about reading labels and safety data sheets, or SDSs, and have general knowledge about the kind of information they provide. They should be encouraged to consult these resources for information, and they should know where to find and how to access the SDSs at your workplace. So now we know what information you need to cover, let's talk about the training itself. First, the standard is pretty clear about one thing. The training must be easy to understand for all employees. In other words, you can't provide complicated materials written in college-level English. It's your job to ensure that the training is accessible and hopefully interesting. The standard also addresses language. If you have employees who speak English as a second language, it's your responsibility to translate training for them. Don't assume that just because someone speaks English at work that they can read and understand complex training in English. I recommend offering translated materials all the time, regardless of the situation. This ensures safety and compliance with the law. When it comes to methods for training, the standard is pretty flexible. You can conduct training however you see fit, as long as the key elements are covered. For instance, if your workplace only has a few chemicals in use, then you might teach staff about each one individually. If your team is working with many different chemicals, or the types of chemicals vary or change frequently, then it might make more sense to conduct a large-scale training session for the entire team. You can conduct the training yourself, bring someone in, train employees online, or take advantage of hazard training programs offered by unions, 
trade associations, or other educational institutions. If you do opt to do online or other training, just remember that you'll need to supplement with on-site training about each chemical. Choosing to combine online training with an on-site session can be the perfect combination because it meets different learners' needs and is easily documented. Remember, OSHA will assess how well employers meet the requirements of the standard. You must demonstrate that you're making a good faith effort to properly train your team. Finally, employers must document all training, including the type of training, when it was conducted, and what was covered. Documenting can certainly be a challenge, so I highly recommend creating internal documentation processes.